and sing hymn number 379, Bless His Holy Name. And the children up to grade three are dismissed to Children's Church. Just need to sing long enough for Donna to get out. That's all right. Barely made it that time. All right. Well, uh, today we're talking more about words. Chapter 18 has a lot to say about the things that we say. Um, I was reading a story this week about how Jesus would vote. Uh, in 2004, uh, University of North Carolina uh, decided that they would have a debate over how Jesus would vote uh, in that particular election. And they got a couple of Christian people to come on up and participate in this debate. And, and so Christian was on one side and another Christian was on another side. And they started uh, to talk about their points and, and then they started to argue about their points. And the debate ended when one of the Christians knocked the other Christian down, he bashed his head, he had to go to the hospital and uh, yeah. Well, you know, yeah, okay, politics is important, but, you know, it's much better to know how to use words to solve conflicts. It's much better to know how to, to say the things that we need to say and to get across the information we need to get across and still remain united as brothers. Still, there are important things that we need to talk about. Uh, so we are using words, and in these first uh, six or so verses, we are talking about verses, uh, w words and disputes as a main theme in this particular little section. There are two themes here. One is of speech and the other is of resolving conflicts. And a lot of these conflicts use legal terms. And so are they, are they setting them in legal places? Are they, are they about court cases? What are they, exactly are they about? But, um, we can use them elsewhere, but they are using legal, uh, Hebrew legal terms. Uh, also scattered throughout are images of getting stronger and getting weaker, and the people who are stronger and the people who are weaker. And that continues a sequence that started back in verse 10. Verse 13 says, He who answers before listening, that is his folly and his shame. Do you start talking before uh, the other person is done? There is a distinct difference between lowliness and shame. This verse talks about, this verse talks about a person being brought to shame. Uh, we mentioned a verse last week that had to do with lowliness and lowliness being a good thing, but shame not being one. One is self-imposed and the other is determined by others. I don't know if you've seen this woman on the Catholic channel, but she really looks like she could shame someone. If pride goes before a fall, then speaking without listening also goes before a fall, uh, comes before exposure and before shame and before all of those things that come without paying attention. One way to exhibit humility, one way to, to become lowly is to listen carefully. I like this sponge head. He's just soaking everything in. Uh, we need to become like that. Our ears need to be sponges that soak in all of the words that people give us before we open our mouth and start to answer. Verse 14, 14 goes on to say, A man's spirit sustains him in sickness, but a crushed spirit, who can bear? Uh, the spirit here is talking about the spirit of man. 
We're not talking about the Spirit of God. We're talking about our spirit. It's not making a statement about whether or not we are body, soul, and spirit or whatever. Spirit is the first line used in each of, uh, first word used in each line here in this proverb. The contrast is between a spirit that holds up uh, and one that weighs us down. Uh, and that suggests that the typical role of the spirit is one that should lift us up. Our spirit should, should support us and buoy us up. The spirit works as a supportive friend, but this is reversed here in this uh, latter half of this verse. And then the spirit is crushed. It can't hold you up. Instead, it becomes a crushing weight itself. And when our spirit has been in shamed by outside sources, when our spirit has been crushed, then we can't help the people that we need, and we can't help ourselves. We need to build that spirit up so that we can uh, work in this world. If the body is weak, the spirit offers strength. This is pointed out when Jesus says, uh, the flesh is willing, but the spirit is weak. When our spirit is weak, our flesh can't last very long. So we do need to work on building up the spirit. The heart of the discerning acquires knowledge. The ears of the wise seek it out. Each line of this verse ends with the word knowledge, just like the previous verse started with the word spirit. This one ends with the word knowledge. This sets it in parallel uh, with our ears, uh, of the wise that seek knowledge and the heart of the discerning that acquires it. And so both of these point to this idea that we need knowledge. Here the heart is the recipient of what the ear seeks out. Now before, we had the heart giving uh, forth uh, words and, and bringing forth truth or wisdom or folly or whatever it brings forth. It's going to come out. Here the ear brings in uh, and, the, and gives the heart what it seeks. Uh, the ear of the wise not only searches for knowledge, but it does so by sorting through truth. This is part of what uh, wisdom is all about. It's knowing which, which proverb to put into place in a particular situation. It's knowing what is truth and what is folly. You know, and we need to be able to sort through those kinds of things so that we can be wise in this world. The ear seeks knowledge so that it can be received and internalized. We need to bring that into our hearts. Because out of the heart comes all this other stuff. And so if we listen to good things, if we internalize them, and if we have listened well, then those things become a part of our life. This is the contrast to the intake that we had back in verse 8, where we had gossip that was nice and juicy, but it's going to give you a bellyache. It's going to give you problems in your life. A gift opens the way for the giver and ushers him into the presence of the great. This verse simply states that a gift opens or makes wide uh, the way for someone. It prepares your way into this, into this presence. It's not saying something neg negative or positive. It's just stating uh, a fact. If the ear of verse 15 seeks to acquire knowledge, well, then the gift only seeks to buy access to power. There may be a difference here. Now, sometimes there's a difference without having a distinction. Have I ever said that? I had a professor who said that all the time. Is this a difference that has a distinction? Here, uh, Jeremy is talking to his mom, and he says, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just trying to point out that you're wrong. Well, that is not a difference. That is a difference that has a distinction there. <laughs> you know? uh, he wants to say one thing and, and be polite about it, but he's not succeeding. Well, is there a difference between a bribe and a gift? Well, yeah, maybe, and maybe not. You know, uh, in, in verse, uh, chapter 21, they seem to be synonymous, gifts and bribes. We should not do either one of them. But there seems to be a difference there, and that is if you're giving a gift, it may be just you're uh, greasing the wheels and you're just making somebody more comfortable and you're, you're trying to build rapport. But if you're trying to buy something that you, you shouldn't have, if you're trying to get something that if you're trying to subvert justice, you know, that you should not do. And so there is a difference between bribes and gifts, but they can be uh, interchangeable as well. The first to present his case seems right, till another comes forward and questions him. Well, this seems to be rather obvious. This is, you know, the first guy across the line is not necessarily the winner. Although in, in this life, if you only listen to the first person that comes and presents their problems, well, yeah, maybe they do get to be the winner. 
because you start believing them. But a wise person waits for the other person to come along and, and share the story as well. There are always two sides to every story, and it's better to hear both sides until you make a decision. Can you read that? <laughs> I like that thing. Um, there are two sides to that phrase. Unlike the previous saying, this observation on social life deals with a situation of conflict. The previous one had to do with goodwill. If you give a gift, people will be happy, happier with you. This one, you know, there's a conflict already going on. You've got two sides that you have to, d to decide between, and uh, it may be difficult to, to figure that out. Verse 18 goes on to talk some more about making decisions. Casting the lot settles disputes and keeps strong opponents apart. The lot, in this context, was used for making decisions. Um, God is not opposed to you flipping a coin and making decisions. He wants you to use wisdom first. But in your wisdom, if you come to a place where you have two equally good opportunities, two good, equally good choices, whether it's a, a chocolate donut or a jelly donut, both are equally bad for you. Uh, no more snacks for you, Spencer, in school. Uh, they just passed rules and no more of that good stuff. Uh, you'll have to have apples. Um, you know, if you have e two equally good decisions, well, flipping a coin is letting God decide. You know, and it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. God, according to the Proverbs, is in charge of the coin flip. Seemingly random events are left up to God. God says, use wisdom first. You know, if you're going to go buy a car, you know, get a mechanic to look at it, test drive it, uh, make, you know, look at the repair reports, get the car facts, you know. But if you walk into a car lot and, and look at a car and flip a coin and say, I want that one, well, you deserve what you get. But if you have two equally good cars, then flipping a coin is, is something that God approves of. And that's what this verse is talking about. This proverb suggests that sometimes it's impossible to choose. It's impossible to tell. I mean, is Bruce Lee better than Chuck Norris? I don't know. <laughs> you know, uh, that's a difficult choice to make. And you've got to decide that. And so you flip a coin uh, in those situations. Today in the Super Bowl, they're going to flip a coin. They don't know who should start, so they're going to flip a coin. It may be that the only way, the only objective way of solving a problem is to flip a coin. And God is in charge of the coin flip, and so, you know, let him choose. And God will make, God will make the right decision. Decisions are compared with the lot, and sometimes there is a sense that the lot gives the decision over to God. And so you're saying, we're going to let God decide this, uh, and, and he does, because he is in charge of all the random events in this world. Now, this may be a wise thing to do, especially if you're between two powerful enemies. Have you seen this commercial between Drew Brees and Harry from One Direction? Uh, ooh, two powerful enemies. Frankly, I'm going to side with Drew Brees. Uh, I'm sure he could tackle a lot harder than Harry. Uh, for those of you who don't know Harry, he's in a boy band and all the little girls love him. Uh, two powerful enemies, you just want to stay clear. You don't want to make either one of them mad at you. And so, saying, let's do this objectively, let's flip a coin and separate these two enemies. The word dispute here is used in this verse and in the next verse, and, is the, and is also, uh, there is also the idea of being strong. And so we're going to talk about the Super Bowl, a dispute that's going to happen this afternoon. Uh, besides, I'm, I'm jacked about the Super Bowl. Uh, an offended brother is more unyielding than a fortified city, and disputes are like the barred gates of a citadel. Disputes between neighbors uh, happen, but they also occur between brothers. This afternoon in the Super Bowl, we have one brother coaching one team and another brother coaching another, the other team, Jim and John Harbaugh. I don't know who their parents are cheering for. Uh, they're they're going to cheer for the winner, I'm sure, uh, and console the loser. Uh, but there are disputes between brothers. The saying observes that these conflicts happen, and they are especially bad. They are bad. Uh, one of the reasons why they're bad is because we expect families to stand together. Uh, and when they don't, there is this feeling of betrayal, and then the brothers get really angry at each other. The second line adds that disputes in general are also impregnable. That ship was called the impregnable. Uh, unfortunately, it went down in a storm. God said, uh, 
you're not impregnable. I am. Um, disputes, all kinds of disputes, uh, sometimes become these towers and are unassailable. These disputes are sometimes caused by one who plots evil and by a contentious spouse. I'm quoting this straight from the, from the book I read, so I didn't put this in about my spouse, okay. Uh, <laughs> came from this book, not me, book, not me, all right? Uh, but a lot of times, we have problems in family relationships. We have problems uh, in, in the world. There are going to be disputes, and there are going to be problems, and we need to figure out how we can help them. In the last five verses, uh, we have some more sayings about speech. Instead of being disputed this time, we get improved, we get better, we get happier, uh, and it talks about the rewards that we have when we use good words. It touches on the ways we talk and, and about the way and our effect on other people. Uh, and the theme is implied through a loving relationship with wives and, and loving relationships between friends who are closer than brothers. From, in verse 20, it says, From the fruit of his mouth, a man's stomach is filled. With the harvest from his lips, he is satisfied. This is one of those where you can say, we'd better be able to stomach what we say. You'd better make your, your speech sweet because you're probably going to have to eat it. You know, one of those sayings that we've heard over the years, and this is saying exactly that. You're going to have to eat uh, your words. You better make them out of, out of uh, cake. This proverb is also linked to verse 8, uh, which was another proverb about eating words as well. The quality of the fruit that comes out of our mouths, uh, that goes into the mouth, depends on what's coming out as well. And this is an interesting cycle because it's not only what comes out of us, it's also what goes into us. And if we, make, if we hear good words and if we say good words, then words are gonna, good words are going to come back to us and it's going to be a, a, a better thing for us. The tongue has the power of life and death and those who love it will eat its fruit. Well, this saying ends with the word fruit, uh, just as verse 20 began with the word fruit. From what has been said uh, in this chapter, the tongue and the words have the power of life and death in our life. They have great significance uh, in this world, and we can use our words to hurt or help people. It is harder to understand in this verse what it means to love the tongue. And that's kind of an odd kind of statement, but it seems to me that uh, what it means is that if we love words, if we love good words, and we examine good words, and we examine how to use good words, that uh, we are much better off. And we, if we love words and, and use them wisely, we will help people in this world. Verse 22 says, He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. Now, this is one of those verses that seems to just get plopped down every once in a while in the book of Proverbs. You know, we've been talking about words, and we've been talking about uh, speech, and all of a sudden there's a proverb about something totally different. Uh, in this case, about a wife. Uh, and it seems to be out of place in, in this particular uh, section. When those happen in the book of Proverbs, we need to sit up and pay attention and try to figure out how exactly they fit. Now, this is the only proverb in, in chapter 18 that quotes from the previous verses, in, especially in the introduction, uh, chapters 1 through 9. And so that makes us take notice that we have a quotation. In chapter 8, verse 35, it says, and I've, I've italicized those common words, for whoever finds me finds life and then receives favor from the Lord. So whoever finds wisdom finds life and receives favor from the Lord. So the, the common words are whoever finds, whoever finds, instead of wisdom, it's a wife, finds life, in, the, in our verse, it's what is good, and receives favor from the Lord. So wisdom is equated with finding uh, a great spouse. There are only two verses in the Hebrew Bible that repeat, uh, use the word find twice. And in 835 is one of them, and this one, in chapter 18 is the other. And that should tell us, this is a great thing about finding. Why should the finding of a wife, good as it is for a man, be linked with receiving God's favor? Well, and it can happen in many ways because wives can help us to become the person that we're supposed to be. Husbands can become, help us become the person we're supposed to be. And then we receive God's favor. 
But we also have to look at it from this point of view, that the wisdom is a gracious gift for God, and it's available to everyone who asks. And a spouse who helps you become a, a better Christian is also uh, a gift from God and is available if you seek her diligently or him diligently. As wisdom calls out and offers herself, so God does. Yet humans have to seek her and be diligently in, diligent in following after wisdom. And the same is true in the relationships that we have and the most intimate relationship that we have with our spouse. We have to uh, diligently seek after this, diligently work on this relationship. This is a plug to go buy flowers this week for your spouses, men. Um, you have to diligently work on that relationship, but you also have to realize that it is a gift from God. It goes both ways. It is a gift from God. And our, whether we're talking about wisdom or we're talking about a spouse. And in both cases, we have to realize they're a gift and we have to work hard at the relationship. An excellent wife or a husband is a gift from God and we have to diligently seek for her. Verse 23 says, A poor man pleads for mercy, but a rich man answers harshly. Well, we can take each line of this uh, proverb separately and, and find a description of life. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this picture here before. You don't see it very clearly here. I would encourage you to go look at it very carefully sometime. There is a wall down the center of this picture, and on this side of the wall, there is a slum. Tin roofs, cardboard walls, no running water, people jammed together. You, it's just house after house after house after house. People living in poverty. On this side of the wall is this amazing high-rise. It has these wonderful balconies running up the side. Each of these balconies has a pool. Uh, I don't know if they're a jacuzzi or what, but there, there's a pool on each one of them. There's a tennis court in the middle. There's a sports club over here. There's green grass everywhere. There's this division. Uh, and that's where you find this, a division between the wealthy and the poor. And in that picture, you see it amazingly clear. The poor man often has to plead with someone who has things to get the things that they need. But the rich man, he doesn't have to worry about it. He can answer harshly to the poor. There is a class distinction, and there always has been, and there probably always will be. There is a hierarchy between poverty and rich, and we have to take note of this in our world. If we're one of the poor, we have to tread gently. If we're one of the rich, well, then you need to watch out how you use your money. Now, the question is, is this just an observation or is this a statement of, of what should happen? Is this another false use of power, uh, the power of wealth? Or is this an example of pride that we have also seen in this chapter? And frankly, it probably goes with a warning that says, rich people, you need to be careful about how we treat uh, the poor. And by the way, we're all rich. The last verse says, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. These, verses, this, these two verses go from having no friends. That's the first, you can see the person walking across these steps. Um, from no friends to many friends to having that one very uh, special friend, the one who loves us. Well, even an offended brother uh, can become an unyielding fortress, but an, a, a faithful brother is something to hang on to diligently. We need to be faithful in our relationships. We need to be faithful in all of those, and we need to love those people around us, and we need to be that kind of person in this world. Here is a reverse image of that unfriendly person that we saw way back in, the, in, chapter, in verse 1 of chapter, of chapter 18. If a friend... There, the person just isolated themselves. Here, the friend sticks closer than that brother. Brothers are meant to be together. Brothers are meant to help each other. Brothers are meant to, be, uh, to care for one another. So we, we come to the end of this chapter, and we, we want to figure out how we can apply that. And frankly, most of this chapter had to do with words. How are we going to use the words that come out of our mouth? And part of them is talk less, listen more is what we need to say. The Proverbs of this chapter make it clear that isolation, self-centeredness, poor judgment, and we saw that starting in verse 1, 
make themselves known through acts of speaking. We can isolate ourselves, or we can bring people closer to us. We can be unjust, or we can use words that bring justice into this world. All of these things can be either used for good or for bad in this world. Readers, find, we find that, that we started with negative statements about isolation and using words badly, and we end up with a br person that sticks closer than a brother, who loves us like we want to be loved and is willing to sacrifice for us. So it, ended, it starts off negative, it ends up very positive. Fools speak first and listen never. The heart of the ears and the... Uh, and ears of the wise seek out knowledge. And we have to patiently listen to both sides of the story. And if we do that, things get better for us. If we're using our words wisely, we will have a better life. Another pair of Proverbs pointed out that a mouth eats the fruit that the same mouth produces. You know, it's a big joke on us. You're going to have to eat the words that you, you said. And so you might as well make them sweet. I, I love this picture because it, was, it made me drool. Uh, it's a graham cracker crust. It's a keyboard. It's a graham cracker crust, chocolate keys on the outside, white chocolate keys on the inside. Ooh, can you imagine the sweet words that that keyboard produces? <laughs> oh, you know, it's just, okay, okay let's go eat. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, we are going to have to eat the words that, that we say, whether we say them out loud or whether we put them on Facebook. You know, however we do it. We're going to have to eat the words that we, we produce. The symbolism, symbolism of these proverbs remind us that we may find gossip tasty. Oh, yeah, it's a little saucy, it's a little good, it goes down. But in the stomach, it just does not do you very much good. It's going to make, give you a stomach ache. What we really need, we read back in verses 4 and 8 about the life-giving streams. That's the kind of water that we need. That's the kind of wisdom that we want in our world. And that's the kind of wisdom that, the words that, that wisdom produces. In the book of James, in the New Testament, it advises that us that a tongue, the words that we use are like the, a, a bit in the, in the mouth of a horse. This little thing, this little piece of metal, can turn this big animal any which way you want. Make it stop, make it go, do whatever you want with it, a little bit. It also talks about a rudder on a ship. A little piece, piece of metal or wood on the back of a boat can make that ship go anywhere you want. It's just a little thing. But it has this immense power. And the words that we use have this kind of immense power. It is capable of corrupting a whole person, especially through boasting and especially through cursing other people. We can use our words to, to destroy people in this world. But James sees a better way. The wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure and then peace-loving. You know, brothers dwelling together in harmony, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, the fruit that comes in, the fruit that goes out, uh, impartial, looked at both sides of the question, sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace and raise a harvest of righteousness. So many parallels with what we've been seeing together. James wants us to practice those just like the Proverbs wants us to practice those. I'd like to conclude by telling you about Mr. Ellis. C.P. Ellis, uh, an amazing individual. He started off life as part of the Ku Klux Klan. He grew up a racist, hate-filled, vehement-spewing, uh, horrible person. Um, he was good at words, and he rose in the ranks of the Klan. For, do you know what the Klan is? Do you know what the Klan is? Ku Klux Klan? Do you know what the Klan is? Okay, haven't been listening in history class. Uh, I'll have to tell somebody about that. The Klan was this organization that started it in the South. It was everywhere. Uh, Oregon, for a long time, was a big uh, center of the Klan. Uh, in the town I used to live in, in in Oregon, we were the Dallas Dragons, named after the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and, you know, nobody objected to this. <laughs> They objected to Indian names being used, but not the dragon. I don't understand. The Klan was a very racist, hate-filled organization. They hated just about everybody who was different than they were, whether they were, uh, came from Italy or, I or Ireland 
or whether they came from Africa, or whether they were Jews, or whether they were Catholics. They just hated anybody that was different. He was a member of that organization, and he was good at spouting that doctrine. And because he was good at spouting that doctrine, when the company that he worked for unionized, now you have your views of, on unions, and I have my views on unions. We won't go into that. But this company was unionizing. Well, the person that was heading up the union goes to Mr. Ellis and says, you're good at this. You're good at talking to people. You need to go and talk to these folks. Well, he was good at spewing anger and hatred. Well, now he had to go talk to folks about joining the union. And he had to start working with all kinds of people. And so he was put on committees with black people and with Jewish people and with Italian people and with all kinds of different people. And he learned that they could be creative he learned that they could be intelligent. He learned that they could be godly. He learned that his views were wrong. And he changed his entire viewpoint. He wrote a book with this lovely lady here, whose name is Martha, uh, you know, called How Mr. Ellis Changed. I think that was the name of the book. He learned to love these folks. Words can change us. Words were used by Mr. Ellis in the first part of his life to spread anger and hatred. They were used in the later part of his life to bring unity and healing. That's the kind of words that God wants us to use. He wants us to bring unity and healing into our families, into our lives, into our world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us words. They come from deep within us and they come out of us and Lord, we pray that what's inside of us will be so wonderful, so empowered by your spirit, that our spirit will bring forth words that heal this world. Lord, we have lots of problems in this world. We face them every day, whether it's at home, whether it's at school, whether it's at work, whether it's in our country. But Lord, we know that if you give us the words, they will be, turn out exactly the way you want them and achieve exactly the result you want to give. Thank you, Father, for using us in our words. In Jesus' name we pray.